I only have the pirate hat. Somehow I only own a pirate hat and not a cowboy hat. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking about some fandom drama that I personally will never forget and I really don't want anyone to forget. So before I get into the entire topic of this video, I do want to make a quick explanation and disclaimer. Because of everything that's happened with Activision Blizzard, the Overwatch team has actually decided to rename Cowboy, um, who they're just calling Cowboy for right now. For a lot of reasons, I, I definitely agree with them choosing to do this and I understand why they felt they needed to. However, due to the topic I'm talking about, I am going to have to call him McCree because the name of the zine was Mick Hanzo. So I am going to call him McCree for now. I do know that they are planning on changing his name and hopefully you guys just understand why I'm doing this. Uh, I'm, it's kind of just a weird spot. I found out like two days ago, like right before I recorded this, that they were planning on changing his name. So Cowboy's name will be changed, but for now I am going to refer to him as McCree because the name of the zine that I'm talking about is McHan zine. Anyway, let's get into the video. So you can probably guess if you've watched a few of my videos, I'm a big fan of Sarah Zed, and one thing I've wanted to start doing is deep dives on various fandom things that I just find kind of interesting. But today I wanted to talk about something that I think is just cultural knowledge that I want everyone to have, especially in the fandom space. To set the scene, it's 2017. The Overwatch fandom is in its height. Tracer, the character heavily featured on the box and in Overwatch artwork, has been confirmed to be a lesbian, and general excitement for the game is growing. The fandom is already massive, Overwatch wins game of the year, and there's ships for every flavor of shipper out there. Whether you liked enemies to lovers ship, mentor mentee to lovers, friends to lovers, friends to enemies to lovers, <laughs> trash humans supporting each other's recovery and growth to lovers. There is probably a ship for you among the cast of characters. Honestly, Overwatch is the only other series that I've been in for fandom that spawned Homestuck style shipping charts so that people could explain who they shipped and why. But of course, with fandom communities often come big ideas, lots of money, and sometimes an incredible amount of controversy. So let's get into the point of this video, the McCann zine. So fandom zines at this point have been well talked about online. There are large archives of information about how to run one, how to tell if one is a scam or just being mismanaged, and how to protect yourself from buying fan merch that you might ultimately never receive. In 2016 and 2017, however, this information wasn't as widely available, and for many younger fans, it was easy to fall victim to buying not even a scam, but just from a fan project that ultimately went awry. I think there's two reasons for this, honestly. For the first time, large-scale fandom projects were something that was accessible to the inexperienced, and making fan-related purchases online was just starting to become more commonplace. For example, most of my fandom buying when I was in middle and high school happened either at Mitsuo Marketplace or anime conventions, both of which were physical places I could go, the product was right in front of me, and short of buying a commission I forgot to pick up, I never really had an issue. Nowadays, you can buy a whole host of fandom-related items online and get them shipped to you, which is awesome, but also leaves buyers and sellers vulnerable in a lot of ways, which is how we found ourselves in the situation I'm about to talk about. This was the first time fandom zines were being sold primarily on a pre-order basis, rather than a dedicated fan providing some seed money to have a zine printed and then distributing those. Because this was the environment around fandom zines at the time, it created the opportunity for the perfect storm, and much like Dashcon, boy did it go up in flames. Like, has its own page on fanlore.org gone up in flames? For those of you who might not have been involved in the Overwatch fandom when this all went down, McHanzo is the name for the popular ship McCree and Hanzo, who you will recognize from my intro joke. It's, it's these two. 
this samurai and this cowboy. These two were a fairly popular pairing from early on because they have a couple of cute bantering voice lines in game where they basically condescend to each other. And some shippers just love that, honestly, myself included. It helped a lot that McCree and Hanzo were voiced by Matt Mercer and Paul Nakauchi, respectively, who were both fairly openly supportive about the ship. Go ahead and give me a fancy chai latte. Not fat, please, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> take it too. Let me get one for my friend Hans over there. And honestly, I really like the ship. There's a lot of similarities in how cowboys and samurai are depicted in their respective medias, so a lot of the tropes played really nicely off each other, making the pairing dynamic and really fun. Plus, like, I'll admit, my probably magnum opus fanfiction project was, in fact, a McHanzo fanfiction, which took me several years to write, edit, and publish, the final word count of which was over 100,000 words. To say the least, I was invested. But many popular writers, artists, and big name fans had popped up in the fandom already, and a few Tumblr blogs had gained enough notoriety that they were running one of the biggest McHanzo servers on Discord. This server was called McHanzone, and it, as well as the accompanying blog, were helmed by Lynn and Ghost. Lynn and Ghost together were the admins of the Tumblr and the Discord and worked together on those, but from what I'm understanding from my research, Ghost wasn't affiliated with the zine, but did help Lynn out on things like McHanzo Week. As an aside, a ship week like McHanzo Week is basically just a planned content boom where everyone would draw or write a bunch of fan art and fan fiction and post it all at the same time. Sometimes each day would have a different theme or prompt, and often these would have Discord servers affiliated with them for organization and general excitement purposes. They're usually really, really fun if you're involved in fandom, and honestly, highly would recommend getting involved in a ship week like this. Eventually, and it's not clear exactly when, since the Wayback Machine only has a few archives of the McCon zine Tumblr from this time, they decided that they should make a zine too, and Lynn hopped on as admin for the project. However, I do know that applications for the zine first opened April 22nd of 2017 to a good amount of excitement. By this point, no one was even remotely aware of what was to come or the fallout that all of this would cause. As you can guess from what I've already said, I was invested. So when I saw a post looking for writers for a McHanzo fandom zine, I applied. I didn't get in, but I was still excited. I kept track of the zine as contributors were announced and production supposedly went on. I was planning on buying it if I could afford it when it came out. So to further clarify, what we've got here right now is basically this. An admin slash mod that runs a popular fandom Tumblr and has no discernible experience, as far as my research shows, in book publications or printing, an excited group of contributors ready to make a fanzine, and a lot of excited fans ready to buy said zine. Now let's talk about November 17th, 2017. the humble Tumblr callout post, being used for once in a way that is actually attempting to hold someone accountable for something. So the original callout post for the McCann zine fiasco read exactly as something like this should, in my opinion. It lays out the concerns, some evidence supporting those concerns, and discussed why they had to use the format of calling this person out publicly rather than speaking to them directly or privately. Also, to their credit, this callout post remained, in my opinion, incredibly neutral. You can pause here to read it if you'd like, but the basics are. From what they can tell after their investigation, Lynn, the administrator in question, had been taking money from the zine fund, which was intended to be donated to charity and using it for personal purchases. Lynn was solely responsible for this as she was the only one with access to the PayPal account. They also apologized for their oversight on that fact, which is kind of impressive for something like this, and fairly professional when you think about it. It was discovered by the aforementioned Ghost, second mod of the Tumblr blog. Ghost, who saw that there were a number of PayPal receipts, which were clearly not related to any zine purchases, in the email they shared for the blog was the one who brought this to the attention of the other mods on the zine. When confronted about it, Lynn at first said she'd be returning the money after she received her next paycheck, claiming that her mother pressured her into providing $1,400 for household-related bills. 
and she said clearly that she did plan to return the money. However, this never happened. When Ghost followed up on it and the smaller receipts for fandom related purchases, which were also in question, Lynn became unresponsive. These are just the big issues and the reasons that the contributors stated that they chose to go public with this information. There's also a big helping of Lynn just generally mismanaging the project and even accusations of being controlling, all of which the contributors said would have been handled internally had they not discovered the theft. I will be honest, some of these complaints range from, yeah, that will happen on a project where people sometimes disagree, to, oh wow, that's concerning. Notably, the judges who were supposed to be picking the contributors were told they'd receive a free copy of the zine for their work, only to have Lynn largely disregard the work that they did by largely choosing contributors herself, and also they were later told that they would not be able to receive free copies because they didn't have enough money. Something that is concerning, especially when coupled with the fact that Lynn was being accused of stealing money from the zine. Also, Lynn took on a lot of the layout and design throughout the book, and as I mentioned previously, didn't seem to have any experience in design, meaning the book was filled with mistakes and was misprinted in a lot of ways. The editor whose name was on the book also never saw a proof of it before it went to print, meaning their name was now associated with something that was done by an amateur who had never done this before. Other concerns included removing candidates that the judges agreed upon because they liked a ship she didn't like, or they associated with people she didn't like, taking on creative control herself rather than delegating the work to someone who knew how to do it, inflating shipping prices for the sake of profit, missing delivery dates for things promised to customers, general dishonesty on a personal level, like she admitted to taking money to write other people's university term papers and things like that. You know, just girly things. <laughs> I am so sorry for that joke. I think I may have girl boss just a bit too close to the sun. <laughs> anyway. So this post was made by a dedicated blog run by an administrator who called themselves Tala. The blog itself is actually still up, though it hasn't updated in a long time, but it's actually called Mikan's Own Receipts. You can go look at it if you'd like. I'll tag it below you know, with everything else, all the sources. And of course, like any call-out post that is well done, it resulted in a very heated response from a lot of different people. Some defending Lynn, some telling further stories about her being just generally not the best. You know, the things that happen on the internet. <laughs> but that was the call-out post which sort of kicked everything into motion and into the public eye. Now, let's talk about the fallout. So at this point, everyone was pretty sure the call-out post was factual. There was a lot of evidence there, the mods were telling people to ask PayPal directly for refunds or to go through their bank, and Lynn had basically gone dark as far as public statements go. The McConzie and Receipts blog honestly was on this, and they did a very good job of holding Lynn accountable in my opinion, while also being sure to inform customers as well as contributors of what was going on. I would highly recommend you scroll through their blog for details, but this is where things get sort of weird. Lynn tried to make several posts defending herself, which she later deleted. Pause to read these, but the most important thing I can gather from Lynn's posts are basically that she didn't really provide any evidence for anything she claimed. Here's the thing, Lynn eventually deleted a lot of posts she made around this time, and also some of them might not have been picked up by the Wayback Machine. However, the main group of posts that Lynn made trying to explain herself provided receipts for things she had purchased for the zine. However, she never provided any full record of the books, meaning meaning that she never showed how much was originally in the account, so nobody could actually do the math to see if the correct amount was still in there. In addition to this, as far as I can tell, she never explained the receipts for Voltron fan merch beyond simply saying she accidentally bought them using the zine PayPal when she intended to use her own. The only issue with that is, is she provided no evidence that she had returned the money to the zine PayPal account. And here's the thing, when it comes down to it, if what Lynn said in these posts were true, it still doesn't really make it okay. Like, I'm just gonna stop here and remind you that I ran a fanzine which arguably failed. We made no money and I actually paid for all of the shipping and materials to ship to be able to get the final products out. If you needed proof of what I was saying to be true, I'm holding the physical zine we made. I put money into the zine and the only time money ever went from the zine PayPal to my own was to reimburse myself for something 
something I had put on my personal credit card because I wasn't able to pay for it using PayPal, which in hindsight isn't good practice, but at the time, if it ever came up, I could provide all of the receipts necessary to show that I had only moved that money as a reimbursement. I had literally the receipts to show that it was an expense. I also took steps to make sure that accidentally buying something with the zine money wasn't even something which could happen. This was in 2018, so I was 24 or 25, just two years older than Lynn. Like, I'm sorry, but there's really not a lot I can say. Even if Lynn had put the money back right away, fellow contributors as well as mods would have had every right to be upset about the situation happening at all. Anyway, putting, putting my zine down. We'll just, we'll just stick that there for now. Now, I'm not sure at all how this happened, but somehow when people who were also in the anti-shipping community got wind of what was going on, they tried to come to Lynn's defense by lying? Now, I want to say right here, as you know, I was heavily involved in the Voltron fandom, and at the time this was going on, Clancy's, aka anti-shippers in the Voltron fandom who stand Lance and liked Clance, were generally pretty young. While this wasn't the rule, the average age seemed to be somewhere between 15 and 20, so please keep that in mind as I explain this. Honestly, I think this situation was just misguided and not actively malicious, but I also think it's important to the story. On November 19th, 2020, 2017, this post appeared for the first time. This post was very long and contained a screenshot from a now defunct blog whose name I really don't even feel comfortable saying out loud, claiming a few things pause to read, but here's the basic idea. One, it claimed that Lynn was 17. Two, implied that Lynn was put in charge of the zine rather than actively choosing to run it. Three, tried to claim that the other mods were immature for making the call out posts that they made, but also that they were trying to gang up on a minor, even though that was probably one of the most neutral and newsworthy call out posts I've ever seen in my entire life. Sorry, I'm gonna inject a few of my opinions here. Put embezzling in quotes as if that isn't exactly what happened and kind of suggested that the actual issue was that Lynn was arguing with the other mods about her personal discomfort with McRae's shippers. That's for those of you who weren't in the Overwatch fandom, that's McCree the Cowboy and Reaper, and went on to claim that creepy adult McRae's shippers were making a big deal out of nothing. I just want to put an aside here. The McRae's anti-shippers were an interesting group of anti-shippers entirely because it was almost completely based on Fanon. And this is a bit of a tangent, but I just find it kind of interesting when it comes down to it. McRae's anti-shippers felt that McCree and Reyes had a father-son relationship and that Reyes had met McCree when McCree was a minor, so therefore they couldn't be in a relationship that was creepy. However, both of those things are not true in canon, and we found out later, because Overwatch didn't release a lot of lore with its initial videos, that McCree was in fact an adult when they met, and they don't really have a father-son relationship. They have more of a kind of boss and close assistant relationship. And even then, McCree is heavily shown to talk back to Reyes and say that the things that he's doing are not okay okay and, and have an honest opinion. It's not like Reyes really controls anything McCree does, he's just a higher rank. I don't know, I just think that's kind of interesting and something to put into this and give further context on this situation, because when it comes down to it, there was nothing about this ship that was actually problematic, it was just not something that anti-shippers liked for some reason, um, or they did not like it for, again, fanon reasons, not canon reasons. This post also suggested that the money was simply mismanaged, going as far as to claim that it was still there and that Lynn was going to get the books out ASAP, which didn't turn out to be true and had already not been true by the time this post was posted. Also, this post provided no evidence for any of this because of course it didn't, but like it's the internet. Um, but what seems to be happening is that they're taking what Lynn claimed happened at face value and also somehow extrapolating all of this stuff to be about shipping. So I was never able to find the original post like as it existed, but the post that includes the screenshot also included an archive of the blog at the time where I found a reblog where the OP added an admission that Lynn wasn't actually 17, but also claimed that the rest of the post was all true. Ultimately, they still claimed that it was all about shipping and had, had nothing to do with any of the embezzlement, which, you know, is a choice. Um, I guess they're entitled to their opinion of the situation. Now, this cycled through anti-shipping communities pretty heavily, and for a really long time, this was the pervasive idea, from what I understand, in anti-shipping communities, that this was about McRae's shippers and not about Lynn embezzling money. Uh, granted, I will say that the people being like, no, 
this is about Lynn embezzling money were kind of the overall majority of people talking about the situation. There was just within the anti-shipping communities, this was the predominant thought process from what I can tell. Anyway, let's unpack it because I think it illustrates an important point in all of this. So here's the thing. We know from the start basically that Lynn can't be 17 because you have to be at least 18 to have a PayPal account. Giving Lynn the benefit of the doubt, let's operate under the idea that maybe Lynn was in fact just over 18, meaning they were about 18, 19 when this was going on, meaning they were very inexperienced. Based on the evidence we had at the time, most of which was from the original call-out post, what about anything listed in this post that I just summarized to you makes what Lynn did okay just because she was barely over 18. I'm also going to stop here to point out that, that the McCann Zone Receipts blog actually made several posts saying that Lynn should not be harassed, that nobody should be sending her death threats, and that her mental health was actually of the utmost priority to them, as well as holding her accountable for her actions. So. What about what Lynn did is okay just because she's just over 18? You could argue that maybe the idea that Lynn had simply mismanaged the money and that the money was actually still all there, but some of it somehow accidentally wound up in her personal PayPal account for whatever reason could make it okay, sort of. But it would only really make it somewhat okay if she had just put the money back the moment the mistake had been pointed out to her, which we know she didn't do. So let's move on from the original screenshotted post and discuss the rest of the post I originally showed you. This, this long one, I mean, not the one that called her out in the first place. This post was created and posted originally on November 19th, and as I stated earlier, it later got reblogged by the McCann's own receipts blog because it had a lot of information in it. However, some of this info is repeat information from the original callout post, so I'm going to focus on the new information we were provided in this. Also, I'm going to skim over some of the more inflammatory language in this post since it was far less neutral than the McCann's receipts post, and some of it I pretty strongly disagree with, but the thing I disagree with are inconsequential to the story. For example, one of the things I disagree with is the fact that the post calls it a bag's cringe otaku culture and implying that Lynn was cringy for simply buying charms and pins. So that's the level of thing I'm cutting out so you guys are aware. First, this post more clearly established that Lynn was over 18 using the basic info about PayPal I already gave you. However, it also pointed out that Lynn's own blog said she was 21. And while plenty of people lied about their age on Tumblr, I think it's likely that based on what her friends said and various things she posted in the McCann's own server that this was true. For example, it's not likely a high schooler or someone just out of high school would be able to successfully sell term papers to university students, like at least in my experience. Second, this post provides at least a bit of evidence of the anti-shipping community trying to claim that this was all about shipping and had nothing to do with the embezzlement, which based on what I've already shown you is just not true. Like the original call up post mentioned shipping a bit, but it spends the majority of its time showing evidence that Lynn had embezzled money that was intended to go to charity, which was the actual problem here. You're a good boy and you would never embezzle money from charity. Don't worry. It also points out the insincerity that came with Lynn's posts trying to defend herself since she promptly deleted them and when it came down to it, they provided no evidence anyway. They didn't really add anything to the situation. Things only got worse from here because people started to receive their copies of the zine and a long post that I'm not gonna get into too much detail about basically broke down all of the issues with the layout, formatting, credits, and many, many other issues with the actual zine. Following this, it also came out that despite claiming they had passed a stretch goal to include a lanyard in the bundle for the zine, the lanyard didn't show up with any of the bundle packages, implying that it was never actually produced. By the way, zines often have accompanying merch allowing people to either buy a zine or a zine plus some cool extras. For example, a really popular sheath zine that I purchased came with like a bunch of mini prints, a couple of pins, a few charms, um, as well as like a bunch of other stuff and like a cute little card that talked about the charity that it donated to. There were other problems with the manufacturing in 
general. And honestly, I will admit that from screenshots and the research I did when I was making my zine, it also seems like Lynn chose the cheapest option possible rather than emphasizing quality, which definitely showed in the final product. But the other half of this is that a lot of people just never even got their zines. At some point, it seems like Lynn just gave up on the whole thing because she had been held accountable for what she did. And we're not really sure if it's because she was being vindictive or if she ran out of money for shipping or a multitude of other things that could have happened. But the point is, is that a lot of people spent money on this and then never received a product. Since all of this happened, Lynn faded into obscurity and really hasn't been heard from since, at least not in a public forum. The contributors and moderators of the zine did try to pursue some kind of legal action, but they were told it was an unlikely case and eventually they dropped that too. A lesson was learned. <laughs> Ultimately, while I don't know of another fandom zine going quite so pear-shaped, I know that a lot of zines have had issues since this one. However, I think this taught us several things. While the internet has created a wonderful opportunity for many artists to create and sell fan merchandise, and on numerous occasions this has resulted in incredible acts of charity, you do need to do your research before purchasing from one of these projects or even joining in on one of them. Also, just because you've seen someone else do it doesn't mean it's going to be something you have the skills to do. And that's okay, but try to admit that before money is involved if you can. Trust me, as someone who spent $400 shipping out fanzines because they had already received money from customers, you should really admit that you're in over your head before you take money from people. Yeah! And three, just because someone agrees with you on fandom stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't in the wrong, and it might be important to do your own research before you jump in to defend them. Finally, I think this situation changed fandom for the better. Consumers are more cautious about zines than they used to be. Creators have more resources to vet zine admins, and zine admins have a lot of research they can turn to now to make sure that projects go smoothly. Well, this situation was very bad in a lot of ways, and ultimately a lot of people did lose money and never received their product, many of the contributors were able to gain a lot of support from the Mikanzo fans who heard that they had been hurt. The artist who designed the lanyard that never got produced wound up making them on their own eventually, and other artists and writers from the project did similar things. This little blip in the Overwatch fandom burned hot and bright for a good while, and eventually died down as many bits of fandom history have in the past. I think what's most interesting about this, and the reason I kind of wanted to tell this story, is the way that it's managed to have a last impact on the way people create, buy, and look at fanzines while not really staying in the cultural consciousness. People who make zines don't say you don't want to go the route of the McCann zine. It just happened and people learned from it, but nobody really talks about it anymore. Anyway, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like my content, consider subscribing. And if you really love my content, you can hit the bell icon to get notified every single time that I post. Here are other places you can follow me if you are so inclined. And on that note, I am going to reread some of of my McHanzo comfort fan fictions. Anyway, have a good day, guys. Okay, can I make this? Uh oh, uh -oh. this is like both speeding me up and slowing me down. It's interesting. It's not like this doesn't speed it up. Yes, it does. Aha, oh God, oh God, no, no, no. Ah, uh, the humbler, the, the humbler. Ah, the humbler, <laughs> question mark. Um. Oh, all of my lighting just changed because the sun shifted. Cool, the McConzine, uh, that the McConzine receipt, that the McConzone receipts blog. <laughs> How far have I gone? Too far? Which definitely showed in the final project. Wait. Oh, I can't do my thing because there's a teleprompter up. I guess goodbye.